Hello, um, everybody, and welcome to our new Sage Politics webinar. Um, why let others explain the world to you? Um, engaging students meaningfully and creatively with political analysis presented by Matthew Loveless. My name is Fawzi Eastwood, and I'm a marketing manager at Sage for the Politics and International Relations portfolio. I'm a cisgender woman of South Asian background. I have short brown hair and brown eyes, and I'm wearing a pink blouse. My pronouns are she, her. Before we start, um, I'd just like to share some webinar housekeeping information. Uh, we're recording this webinar. Um, however, we've switched off the cameras um, and muted the microphones for all participants except for the presenter and host. Um, this is so that everyone will be able to enjoy the session without background noise. Um, the chat box won't be available for participants during the webinar, but the Q&A box will be. So do send us your questions um, that you'd like Matthew and Chiara to answer, and um, they'll be happy to answer them during the Q&A section at the end. Um, so as I mentioned, um, the webinar is being recorded, and we will share the recorded webinar to our SAGE YouTube channel over the next couple of weeks. We'll also share it, share it via email and on Twitter, channel at Sage CQ Politics. So there are closed captions available for this webinar, um, so please do turn them on if they're helpful for you. Sage has been supporting journeys to knowledge for over 50 years, and we're driven by the belief that social and behavioural science has the power to improve society. We are proud to produce high quality resources that support instructors and inspire the future leaders in the field. Our progressive, global and fast growing textbook programme is at the forefront of innovative scholarship and research, along with our prominent portfolio of journals and reference materials. With student success at the heart of what we do, our critical thought provoking textbooks empower students to engage with cutting edge research, analyse the issues of today and understand the rapidly changing world of politics and international relations spanning research methods to conflict resolution, introductory international relations to public management, security studies to statistics. We're committed to promoting diverse and prog progressive topics, discussions and voices. I'm delighted to introduce our first Sage Politics webinar today, which focuses on statistics and political research methods and is presented by author Matthew Loveless, who will be sharing key themes on the topic and sharing specific cases referenced in his recently published book, Political Analysis, a Guide to Data and Statistics. The presentation will be followed by an interview and discussion with fellow political science lecturer, Chiara Bonelli, and they will round off with a Q&A section at the end. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> um, you can find out more about Matthew's new book at our website, www.sagebook.co.uk or scan the QR code. We will be sharing this slide at the end, so, um, and you can kind of, um, see it there and like just follow the link to the website or follow the QR code to um, get 25% off or an inspection copy if you're a lecturer. But now, without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome my presenters today. Matthew Loveless is an Associate Professor in the Department of Political and Social Sciences at the University of Bologna in Italy. He is also co-founder of the Centre for Research and Social Progress, the ERSP. He's taught quantitative methods to undergraduate and graduate students since 2003. He's held multiple academic positions in the US, the UK and across Europe. His research interests include the field of political behaviour in Europe, particularly as it relates to how individuals perceive and make sense of politics. Recent examples focusing on political attitudes including, include International Political Science Review, Political Studies and the Journal of European Public Policy. Recent publications also include co-authored work that incorporate party competition with recent publications in Government and Opposition, Electoral Studies, and the Journal of Common Market Studies. He is the author of Political Analysis, a Guide to Data and Statistics, published this year by SAGE. Um, he'll be joined by Chiara Binelli. Chiara received her PhD in Economics from University College London. She is co-director of the Centre for Research and Social Progress and Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Bologna. She has been Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Milano, Milano Bacocca, Assistant Professor at the University of Southampton, Visiting Assistant Professor at Bocconi University, Postdoctoral Research Fellow at the University of Oxford and Newfield College, Research Scholar and a Research Associate at the Institute for Fiscal Studies. She has worked on returns to schooling, economic and social inequality, 
youth unemployment and climate change's perceptions through environmental actions and support for green policies. She is currently working on research projects merging data science and economics and on the social impact of artificial intelligence. A huge welcome to you both. I believe I'm going to share my screen now. Chiara, do you want to introduce yourself quickly? Hello, uh, my name is Chiara Binelli and I'm a professor of economics uh, at the University of Bologna or UNIBO. I've taught quantitative methods in the UK and in Italy, and this year I've used a uh, Matthew's textbook to teach a compulsory class in statistics at UNIBO. I'm a vegetarian, and since I was a little girl, I wanted to make the world a better place. I thank very much Sage for this opportunity to contribute to this discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Kyo. Uh, as uh, has been very thoughtfully introduced, uh, I've had the unique opportunity to work and live uh, and, and teach uh, quantitative methods. Give me an opportunity to develop my instruction skills in a variety of different set settings as a person. However, though, uh, I'm, I'm trying, I'm, I'm struggling to be a vegetarian for sustainability uh, and health reasons. And at the same time, uh, I, I'm pro equality in all its forms. But I wanted to introduce to you today uh, kind of the pedagogy that informs the, the, that went into the writing of this book. Um, I felt that I needed to write a book to meet some needs that uh, that were in the in the market. Uh, and what I mean by that is having taught in different situations, I realized that there were some core themes, some common themes and common struggles among people who teach statistics. And so I thought that I would draw them together for you today and present what might be, or can, hopefully can be, um, a step forward in uh, improving our delivery um, of the material, but also improving student success and experience with statistics they can take with them and move on, move out from there. For the for this webinar overview, I wanted to hit kind of three spots uh, or two main spots. With, uh, the main section of the pedagogical approach uh, is meant to address the kind of common challenges to statistics instructors at the university level. And I'm going to engage the issues of attention, <laughs> uh, uh, engagement, uh, and retention and, and improving student success. And then I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the book itself and how it got made uh, and why it's made the way that it is. And I hope that all of this can be helpful for you in understanding why this book uh, has been helpful, helpful for us, having used it recently in this, this semester. Let's start from the beginning. When we first got together and we put together our, our, concern, our concerns about how to present this idea or present the idea of a pedagogy on how to address teaching statistics, uh, one of the big concerns came up was meeting students' needs because often uh, the classes that we have are, are a mixed bunch uh, and we need to bring, and we're bringing them a material that's often perceived as somewhat difficult. Uh, and, and in doing so, that, that, uh, that material can be quite intimidating. And this is a common concern among, among many, uh, many other instructors that I've spoken to as well. I also want to talk about not only getting them into the classroom, keeping them in the classroom, but also uh, uh, bringing them to the end of the, uh, the course of your course uh, with success and how we might go going about do that. So I reframed this in, in three different, I broke it down into kind of three different ways. One is student attention. Uh, how are we going to get and, and uh, uh, get their attention? Two is engagement. How are we going to make them you know, involved in the process of learning and learning statistics? And the third one is how we're going to move these students to success. And so I want to I want to come back here and, and focus on uh, the three these three uh, elements. The first one, attention, is getting people to not be afraid of it. To walk into the classroom and say, "This is something that I can learn. This is something I don't need to be afraid of." The second one we're going to talk about is engagement. We're going to make student we're going to make the material relevant to them, improving the relevancy of the saliency. It is to students not just taking this dry course, this mandatory course they're forced to do, and of course, again, moving them towards success. Let's focus on attention to start with. In the US and in the UK, it's quite common to have these large, and it's quite common to have these large classrooms. You may have taught in one yourself. I certainly have. In fact, one of the classrooms I used to teach with was, was the movie theater on campus because it had 375 seats, which was necessary for a large introductory mandatory class, a course, first year course, sorry, second year course in political science. And you may have this as well. And, and in the US, it's very common to take a semester long course or even a year long course in statistics. In the UK, this is quite common, but increasingly here on, on the continent as well, at the University of Bologna, for example, this is the first time we've offered a mandatory master's, a, 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 a master's degree with a mandatory stats class in the first semester, um, which is the first one in Italy. 
to do so. Uh, and we had an enormous amount of people apply for it. We had more people apply for this course than any other uh, course and this course previously. So there's a demand for that. Um, and I think that's really the target audience for that. That's been the class that I've taught the most. I've taught classes that are smaller, around 15 to 25, and I've taught, again, the largest class up to 375. 375. And that has been, uh, 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 but what I found in, in doing so is there are some commonalities, some challenges that are common to all of us. Now, an intense, intense small course has the advantage of allowing the teacher to have more one-on-one -on -one interaction. And I think that's a huge advantage for that, for that setting, but that's not um, uh, the most common setting. We're increasingly having these large classes and that's kind of where this is set. The book is meant to, to help students sink their teeth into or sink their claws into holding onto something that they can enjoy watching. Sometimes people accidentally refer to their fear of statistics as uh, arithmophobia. Arithmophobia is actually a, a fear of math in general, but I'm talking about there is a real and observable uh, fear of statistics. And, and not just the big numbers and the formulas, but just even having people look at columns of data or even reading about the interpretation of, for example, a regression table can make people nervous, make them anxious about this. Um, what we're concerned about there is this kind of phys uh, physiological, mental, even physical reaction reaction to seeing uh, data and numbers. And so one of the first things that we do, or one of the first things we talk about in the book is that the big surprise for, <laughs> for most people is that we don't, we don't really do a lot of math and statistics. I mean, the statistical programs with which we often train our, st our students with SPSS or with Excel or with Stata or with R or even Python, these programs do the math for them. What is important for them is to have, is to grapple with um, the, the concepts you can grapple with the intuition that underpins these uh, what what it is we're doing. And I tell this to a lot of people, the first step in seriously confronting the challenge of accessibility is addressing what the perceived limitation of having little or no previous statistics or ma a minimal math background. I think this comes as a big surprise to a lot of students that you don't even you're not even going to do a lot of math. In fact, the most difficult thing that we do really without actually crunching all the numbers ourselves, is determining whether one number is bigger than another. When we do a t, when we do a t test or a significance test, for example, um, and once we tell, once we allow students to, to understand that they're they're not going to be overwhelmed, it's not going to be a flood of numbers that are coming at them. You can get them to write themselves to you and go, okay, I'm listening. I'm listening. Continue uh, with 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 your with your sales. Um, and again. This can be uh, depending on the way that you teach, uh, the way that the the, uh, the approach that you make for us, for for me, and having taught this class, and I will explain this that why, where this class came from at the end when I talked about the origin of this book, um, is that a lot of what we do is is creative. A lot of what we do is is really about um, understanding what we're doing. So the second step in doing this is really uh, in, in in confronting accessibility, is focusing on students' intuitive knowledge saying you, you can do this if you just understood how it worked. And so we're gonna talk about how that is and as well as the conceptual compre comprehension. And I wanna talk a little bit about what that sounds like. What we spend a lot of times doing in statistics is, is simply figuring out what's the most appropriate thing to do. What do we ask Stata to do to these data? What happens when Stata manipulates these data? What am I seeing when Stata returns the, these results to me? What am I seeing? What does it mean to, to have done this? I, I, I talk a lot about, uh, in the class, we talk about measures of association between nominal and ordinal level variables. And I said, let's talk about association. And what does that mean? I mean, it's not, it just sounds like a fancy term, measures of association. And, oh, it's something I have to learn, something gammas and lambdas and all these kinds of things. So now let's think about what it actually means. Association in terms of statistics is one variable. That, let's say that we have two variables that are associated very highly. What that tells us is that if you know where one variable is, you're pretty likely to figure out where the other variable is. That's what association is. If two variables are not associated, you're unlikely to find them where you expect to find them. So a low measure of association or a low association means that knowing where this, knowing where this variable is tells me very little about where I'm going to find the other variable. But a high measure of association doesn't. And it's the same thing you would find if you have kids or friends with kids, for example, you know that sometimes they have a best friend. Right. And if you can't find them, you can call their parents and say, hey, you know, Sophia was playing with Dario. Where's Dario? Well, she went down to the ice cream store. And you can go, well, since they're always together, they're always associated. I bet we can find Sophia down there as well. And if you find friends that have, she, you know, your friends that your, your kids or your friends' kids don't play with very much, if you don't find them with Dario at the ice cream shop, you might call someone else and go, 
Well, sometimes she hangs out with Vera. Where's Vera? Ring, ring. Vera's at the playground. Well, we know that she doesn't hang out with Vera much, so she might be at the playground. That's what association actually means. And when we start thinking about it, this when you put the variables in, all of a sudden you get a sense, you, you want to give them a sense, a little handle on what it is they're doing. Another example of, I don't know, conceptual comprehension, for example, is the logic of, 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 of um, PREs, proportional reduction of error statistics. That's what we're doing. We're reducing the errors that we make. That's why it's a fancy name, but it actually is telling you exactly what it's doing. I get up, <laughs> uh, so I've made these errors in trying to figure out what I'm doing. Do I reduce those errors by a, an amount that, that's useful to me, for example? If I can reduce those errors a lot, that's really great. That tells me I'm making a lot less errors, which is not just a great thing to say to yourself in the morning every day. Today, I'm going to make less errors. But it's also a great way to find out if two things move together in a significant way. The second step in focus, focus, focusing on student learning is understanding what it is we want to know and why we want to know that. I think sometimes uh, this happens a, a little bit uh, when we sometimes we get we get kind of uh, we, we teach you for example an idea and you go do this and this is the answer right just kind of this kind of rigid in, in, instruction of, of this is what we do and this is what we get when we do that for example a lot of times I find that if you ex you can explain it as what is you're trying to do well, what is, what would be the thing we would learn if these variables move together well we would learn that that we could understand that this moves with that. Therefore, any change in this produces a change in that or is associated with a change in that. So if we want to find a lot of that, we can find a lot of this, for example. We start explaining about what it is we want to know and why we want to know that in doing this, or it even partially explains how we might go about finding out. So when you can motivate them to see what it is the payoff of finding out the answer, they go, okay, well, I, I want to get to that payoff because that helps me understand something better. A lot of this is bringing that into their world. Uh, if they're interested about a particular topic, a different topic that they, they're interested in, you can, you can use different examples in order to kind of motivate students to say, yeah, that would be something I would like to be able to know. If I'm investigating um, uh, political institutions in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, I, you know, here's a way you can get at that that helps you understand that better. And this is, what it, this is how we can do that. So again, being funded, you know, Foundationally competent with statistics is knowing what we can do with statistics and, of course, what we can't do. And creating this intuitive and conceptual base really it, it easily, more easily connects them to the eventual technical parts, the eventual parts where they're going to have to do a little bit of a little, a little bit of that math, for example. And so when they go into those formulas and when they go into those more difficult situations, understanding what it is they want to achieve on the other side, it really does make it better and make it make it easy for them. The next step I want to look at is making. Uh, uh, making statistics relevant. And one of the ways we do that is understanding that sometimes, and this is going to be, I don't want to hurt your feelings, not every political science in the student in your class really wants to be there. I mean, you've got your poor group of political science interested students, you've got some pre-law students mixed in there, you've got a bunch of people going, man, I just need three credits and I'm out of here, and you got disinterested and terrified and <laughs> same proportions it's sitting in the back. I mean, it's not, the class is not this unique. So we think of ourselves as walking in going, here's a political science example and everyone should be uh, automatically entertained by this. It turns out that that's not, it's not a great way to go about it. One way I do this when I teach my class is I've, I teach it kind of critically, almost like statistics has to prove it to me too. And so I act a little bit critical or, or treat statistics almost badly a little bit, a little bit like, let's see what you can do. Right. Because then they can go, hey, wait a minute, that's how I feel, too. You know, I want, you know, I'm just don't, I don't want someone just to yell at me, do this and then go do this on this exam on this day. But rather say, you know what? Statistics actually has to prove this to me. I want to see what it can do. Let's let we, let's uh, we know we're trying to avoid saying, you know, go through this. We should, instead should focus on is saying. What do we want to know here? In statistics, we would use this technique and it would tell us this thing. Is that something that you could use to make a decision? Is that something that you could say, uh, uh, that's a significant difference, or this is meaningful to me in making, in, in making a policy recommendation, for example. So again, one way, to, again, is I treat a statistic a little bit critically. This makes them uh, a little bit more interested because they have to be smarter than just doing statistics. Statistics is something, you, you make them a part of the larger investigative process. And that's a big part of this book is that I don't want to be, the, the students to think of themselves as statisticians. I wanted them, th I wanted them to think of themselves as investigators. 
And so they're going out to investigate these questions and statistics is one of the tools they're learning how to use. It's not the only tool, may not even be the best tool for all questions, but that's one of the ways that we can improve um, uh, the relevancy or increase the relevancy for students. It's, 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 it's carrying them along on this investigative uh, process. Another, another strategy that uh, I have found is that I uh, present real data. I mean, I, all my examples in class and all my examples, for example, in the book, all come from real data that you can get and download and use. Uh, and uh, these are you know, surveys, for example, European surveys or, or surveys from Latin America, for example. These are macroeconomic data that come from World Bank or from other local other places in different parts of the world, and, um, in Asia, for example, or even nor in North America. What I have found is that uh, U.S. students can, not often, but can be a little bit polarized on some of the, the things that are they're shown in, in, the, in, the, um, in, the, in the examples, for example. One of the problems or one of the heavy reliances on uh, one of my biggest criticisms of the existing data uh, statistics textbooks that exist is that they are populated almost entirely by American examples. You have um, uh, uh, the question about gun control between Democrats and Republicans and whatnot, and off you go. And that's a fine question to ask, and it's a very useful one. But one of the reasons that it gets used again and again and again for the difference of means test is because most of the people who write that textbooks are Americans or are American trained, and that's the way they learn. And so it's just kind of replicated as a way of this is the way I did it, this is the way I did it. And so I started making, yes, the very difficult effort of finding the way to, to find enough questions and to find enough questions to, to, to make this work, to, to, bring, to highlight the techniques that we are investigating or we're using, we're interrogating, uh, but make it more interesting by looking at different parts of the world, corruption in the world, role of internet in Africa, for example, political participation, uh, the change of political participation in Europe. A lot of this is 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 much more at home for a non-US audience. I mean, I find myself a lot of times teaching a class against difference of means, and you say, you know, a stance on gun control between Democrats and Republicans, and it's why do Americans like guns so much? And, and you go and just look, I, you know, now's not the time. We can have this discussion, but let's let's learn the statistics, which is that's what this class is about. Um, and, you know, the U.S. politically is a little bit different than a lot of countries, uh, the way that it's organized in the multi-party systems in other parts of the world, for example, are much more familiar to a European audience. And so I found that by kind of moving the questions kind of farther out the field in more geographical areas, more themes related to comparative politics and IR, I got a much better sense, uh, I got a much stronger response from students being engaged, listening, listening and paying attention. Um, again, and I think that's the whole process. I mean, this is really key is, is that if we take the students along as part of our investigation process, investigative process, you, you know, struggling, find good examples and introduce problems is what we do. <laughs> that's what we do. Uh, and, and so it, it, you, you're, you're kind of letting them in, kind of pulling back the curtain a little bit and, and the students really appreciate you being honest with them and saying, look, you, if you want to answer this question, you need this kind of data, and it's not always easy to work with, and you know, it's not like a textbook example. And, that's, and this, this is why we have to kind of wrestle with this and think about it and understand what we're doing. What's our transformation happening, doing that we're doing to these data? What, what is happening to this? And understanding if our, trans, if there, our choice is correct, if our choice is the best that we need, for example. And by doing so, uh, uh, you know, we really draw them into that. And I really want to undermine the expectation that statistics are like this kind of analytical knife that you go, I have a problem, statistics, I'll solve it kind of thing. I wouldn't say, no, it's just one of the tools we can use and it can be really good for a lot of questions and it can be a, a bit more challenging with different types of questions. But let's understand where it works and what doesn't work in the real world. How do we make states, well, how do we address making statistics relevant? You know, the, the students that are in the back of the class and those that are even negatively oriented to doing, to doing statistics at all, which are, are welcome to, to disagree with the approach, the positive approach, whatever, or those who are just not paying attention. I just need free credits and I'm out, man, kind of thing. I think one of the ways of teaching, it's been my experience that by varying or varying the data and varying the, 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 the examples that we use, but at the same time, treating statistics a little rough, they, they really go, hey, wait a minute, you know, this guy isn't trying to dogmatically impose his worldview on us stuff. It's just about how do, how do we understand, how do we get from the question to the evidence. How do we go from, how do we go asking the good question to determining if this evidence is gonna be enough for us to make, make our decisions? And with the substitution of this more diverse data for the kind of American textbook examples can be an effective strategy in both attention and, and, and engagement. Finally, outside of political science, and why do, I, why do I, mention, why I mention this is because 
uh, you know, a lot of this is about thinking. A lot of this is about thinking about uh, solving problems. And so it's not, instead of going, the political science questions or examples should be enough for, for, for people to be tuned, uh, you know, turned on by this. And there are people who are interested in going to policy world, government, other disciplines, anything really outside of academic political science, to be honest. And teaching people or encouraging people to, to, to turn on their puzzle solving part of their brain rather than just flunk, fill in the numbers, get an answer. I don't know what this means, but I know it's right. And off you go. Uh, doing, doing statistics essentially in a vacuum. So the concepts, the techniques, the terminology are presented with a focus on student intuition and conceptual comprehension. And I, what I, I want to underscore this in my experience for 20 years teaching this um, is that it does not undermine the next steps of doing it themselves and sitting in, this, in, the, in, the, in the computer classroom, in the computer lab, and doing these problems. It actually seems to really help. Doing this creates a foundation for them to say, look, I know what I'm actually doing. And so it isn't so rendering to, 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 to do this activity. And again, the third part, again, retention, moving students towards success. I'm sorry for these slides. I don't know why this is jumping. I, this is all very exciting for everyone. There are three, I, I, I aim for three variations of success. You have to understand that you can't take 375 students and make them into joyous statistics using political science students. That's not going to happen. But what you can do is uh, give them an understanding of what, I even joke in the, I joke, I joke to some of my students go, if you hate statistics, at least learn it so you can have a, a decent critique. Saying you don't like statistics because it's stupid is, is gosh and, 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 and lazy. You know, say, say something interesting. It has a really difficult time addressing the, the limitations of the central limit there. You know, that's much more interesting. That's much more engaging. Uh, engaging those and as, so asking these students to succeed, I really think of that in, in three, three significant ways. One is statistical literacy. This is being able to read, engage with, uh, with data, whether they're being used correctly or whether they're being used effectively. Even just watching the news in the evening saying that's the ecological fallacy or that's a, a misrepresentation of that data or they reported the margin of error incorrectly, for example, being an educated person. Another level uh, is the statistical ability is being able to originate analysis do, using statistics, for example, and of course, very importantly, interpreting the results. And finally, the broader set of investigative skills, research skills that are crucial to uh, university students, how statistics fit into more fundamental analytical approach, how to ask a good question, and what constitutes evidence as an answer to that question. When can we make a decision based on our question? These are all skills that go way beyond, uh, way, are useful way beyond a stats, a nine week, 10 week, 12 week stats class. These are, these are the things, so some of the goals that we aim for, uh, that I've aimed for and seem to be extremely effective. One of the examples of this uh, is what I call structure based learning, or what I have heard referred to as structure based learning, rather than just asking people just simply to remember everything. So, uh, on hypothesis testing or significance testing, or even doing regression, I just created a, a checklist. You have to do every, you have to do these six things. And so if you're doing regression, you start doing this. If you, do, you first describe the variables. Second, you, know, you, you uh, determine the, co uh, the, uh, co um, the correlation. Third, you, uh, you can find the bivariate um, regression to see what the initial relationship is between your variable of interest and the dependent variable, for example. And then you build your model. And each step is, is there. And I have found that um, uh, some students, particularly the math phobic, really respond to this. Uh, they're very pleased to see, they're really nice to have something that's less subjective. They just have to follow the rules. And that's been a, a, promise, a real promising um, uh, approach for uh, getting, bringing a greater percentage, a greater group in, that, you, that you have in your classroom to, across the goal line successfully. Um, again, if we keep, our, if we keep our, 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 our eyes on the goals and increasing people's analytical skills, um, we can really find success in many different ways. I think if you want to sum up uh, um, what it is that this, this pedagogical approach of this book actually, or the pedagogical approach of, 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 of that, that addresses the common challenges of statistical and statistics instructors, the university level, it's, a, it, it's really a focus on intuition. It's a, a focus on creativity, a focus on a larger skill set than just statistics. And if we just place that, if we use statistics as the means to elicit these different things, uh, these different uh, attributes, these different talents, these different skill sets, these uh, uh, things that people can develop, for example, a lot of what, a lot of what happens in statistics happens before we even get to the screen. Decisions that we make, which variables to include, what it is we're looking for, the technique we're going to use, 
and of course, how we interpret that, 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 that those results correctly. All of these are absolutely essential to the effective and, 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 and correct use of statistics that often get left out with a focus too much on the, 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 tech, the, the technical part of it. And I think that I think a lot, I think there's a tendency towards tightening that technical screw as a way to say, this is really important, rather than stepping back and saying, is this the best way to attach this piece of wood to this piece of wood? Do I need to just turn the handle harder or hit it with a hammer harder? Or do I need to step back and say, am I approaching this question? Am I approaching the way that I'm investigating? Am I approaching the way I understand something in a meaningful and important and an instructive way? Statistics is more than just rote number crunching. It's, a, it's an activity. It's a skill requiring combination of intuition, of knowledge, and creative skill. And I think if we were to, and, and again, this isn't a solution to all problems, and this isn't even a, solu the, uh, a solution to, 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 to make your life uh, 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 easy without any problems in your class. This is something that I've been working on for years and years and years. Uh, and I think it's something that's useful. I have seen other instructors and have learned from other and better instructors and watched them as they've used a lot of this. And I think not really realizing that they were doing it. And I thought if we could elicit this and formalize it a little bit or think about it, 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 it say it, <laughs> say, if you, you know, were to, to, to step back from, what you, from, from the, the kind of hardcore ah, statistics uh, and think about it as, 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 a, as a, a tool that fits on a tool belt. And really think about that tool belt uh, rather than just one one piece one uh, one tool on that belt. For example, students really seem to respond. The resistance goes down. They're willing to listen. You have their attention. You can get them engaged. Uh, and, and ideally, you can move them across the goal line, which is really what we want. And I wanted I wanted to take a few minutes here to talk about where this book came. Uh, so I. As, as you know, on this webinar, I, I, I wrote this statistics textbook, and I want to talk a little bit about it because I think that informs a lot of why, the way that it's written. So in, in the 90s, a long time ago, uh, I was a math teacher in high school, which I enjoyed very much, uh, but I felt like the, I, I wanted more for me. So I decided to do a PhD and, and enjoy that work. But I found myself attracted to two fields, comparative politics and method, methods. And um, I wasn't the best methods person in my class. Uh, there were... Uh, many people much smarter than me much smarter than me uh um but i think that uh i kind of fell into doing that and when i got my first job it was teaching statistics to undergraduates and graduate students at georgetown and i just went in and did what i was told i just went in and said oh this is what i was the way i was told so here it is uh and i did that there and then i went to knuckle college at oxford for several years and taught in methods courses there and it was exactly the same way. It was just, here's an enormous amount of material and it, it looks very, it gets increasingly difficult as you move down the page uh, and there are a lot of formulas. Uh, and that's the way that I had learned. And I thought, well, I guess this is the way that it's taught. I, I moved from, from Oxford back to the US and then, and then I made a, a, a quick return back to uh, the UK at the University of Kent. And I was presented with the opportunity to teach what was commonly referred to by the instructors as the albatross. <laughs> the albatross was, uh, a second year political science course, uh, mandatory course on statistics in a program that had been had been historically very qualitative and even kind of a, a, a positive. I'm moving away from positive approach at all, interpretive approach, which is totally fine. Uh, but they decided for some reason they're going to make this a mandatory course. And there was a groaning, a moan, a moan and groan. And the way that it was being taught, there was someone who had, had was there before me. Uh, and out of four stars, I think the class had 0 0.6 stars. I mean, and the, the guy the guy was really giving it his best shot. And it was just, it's just a tough class to teach. And so I had been, and they said, well, why don't you do it? You've been teaching it for a while. And I said, well, uh, what's the problem? They said, it, there's just not a lot of math literacy and there's not a lot of math interest. And so can you teach them how to do a regression? And so I spent most of that summer designing a course that was going to be able to take a group of people from nothing and, and maybe even with their heels in the sand and drag them across multiple regression. Oh, that's where my goal was to get them that far. And I developed this intuition. I sat down and, and, and took 
took it, took <laughs> kind of took my took a step back and said, what if I didn't understand this? And I looked at this page. What would I need to know to understand this? And that's where it came from. It started to light up. I was like, oh, well, association is something you, you talk about all day long without using a number. Once the concept is there, applying the numbers becomes something else. And then really what was important is, is, is explaining to students, this is what we're going to do, and this is what you're going to get. And it's already intuitive to you, just hadn't, it hasn't been explained to you this way. And I managed to get um, uh, a high rate of success. Uh, I measured both by scores, but also uh, final uh, exam scores, but also by um, the ranking for the class, which was 3.4 stars. And that was the lowest it ever got the remaining time I was there. Um, it became a very popular course. In fact, I was asked to teach another <laughs> a mandatory first year course called Intro to Politics um, because of this, because of the success of this story and being uh, the, of this of this class and being able to bring it all together. And so, I mean, uh, it's it 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 it, it it started to form in my mind an idea about you can do this all as, as one thing. Uh, you can do this as, okay, I'm gonna try to go back to this real quick here, I go. One of the reasons that I decided to write a book though is a very different question. Uh, I was looking around at uh, other people. I, so I, in, in order to improve this class, I was looking at other people's syllabi and I was asking students to share their stuff with their Erasmus students and stuff and looking at, and what I realized is that statistics is taught in a myriad of ways. <laughs> Um, there's very little consistency, except you often start from variables and you very much, you very much end up around multiple regression or maybe logic, for example. Uh, and I thought, okay, but the path between those two seems a really different in some places. Uh, so in some places you get this kind of aggressive approach that passes through experiments and whatnot, and you end up on multiple regression. Other ones take, what's that? Oh, I'm over 30 minutes. Okay. Um, are you sure? <laughs> it, and the, uh, um, uh, but I man, um, 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 uh, managed to put managed to put it all together, and it, and it started to make this this kind of formal formal uh, this body body of approach, this way to approach this thing. And so these things came out saying, you know, what is statistics doing? It's good at description. It's good at control. It's good at inference and stuff. And I realized that you can't teach st st statistics willy nilly. It has to be organized. It has to be organized in a way that people can wear. Can read and to be quite honest, uh, I found myself jumping around and, and there are a lot of good stats books, but I found myself jumping around so much, um, and so I just imp implemented a lot of what I had been what I had shown you here. One of the things, very quickly, I just wanted to say this. I've been told that I've got to wrap this up. I'm just enjoying talking about this. You can see in the flow of the book, it goes from the scientific method, setting the the, the foundation to descriptive statistics and inferential statistics, and I'm glad to talk about why I separated those into multiple regression and and, and forward. Um, one of the things that I wanted to read for you quickly is I wrote a uh, prolog. So in, in the book, one of the things you hear a lot is I, see, I, I write very kind of motivating statements to encourage people because I, I noticed that just telling people that they're doing a good job really had an effect. People responded to that. You know, pick it up and do it. Why let the other people explain the world to you? Keep going. I, I'll piece of the book. Uh, so I, I wrote a prologue for the book. And so I'm going to read to you real quick. This book is only nominally about statistics. It's substantively, substantively about empowering you. Learning statistics is just like learning any skill. In this case, statistical skills can help you with the consumption and ex execution of quantitative analysis. However, these skills can also equip you with the power of logical thinking, thoughtful analysis, and proper interpretation. That is, the practice of critical and clear thinking can be used as a shield and a sword against unclear logic, spacious arguments, and deception. I want you to have the confidence to interact with statistics and in doing so make you a more formidable student and citizen during your study, I invite you to return to this paragraph if you start losing motivation or feeling overwhelmed to remind yourself the real value of being an educated person. And with that, I want to say thank you, uh, and I apologize for going over a little bit. Sorry. Thank you very much, Matthew, for that fantastic presentation. And um, just to remind everybody that, you know, we are taking questions and answers. Uh, so do write them in the question box and we'll come back to you with the um, responses to those. But now I'm just going to kind of open up the floor to Matthew um, and Chiara Bianelli, who will now be um, discussing some issues faced by academics um, when it comes to teaching the fascinating world of statistics. Over to you, Chiara and Matthew. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, uh, Matthew, for uh, really a very insightful presentation. So uh, I've been using this textbook this year, and so I'm really, again, uh, very happy to be here to try to contribute to the discussion, because uh, one of the main uh, um, problems I found uh, uh, when I was teaching, when I've been teaching statistics, is that uh, most often students may be able to go through the motions of doing statistics 
but they don't really understand uh, the quantitative approach to research. So they, for example, may well, uh, very well apply formulas, even sometimes already know how to run do files in data or programming R, but they really miss the big picture. And for me, something that has been very relevant uh, when teaching this year was the discussion of the scientific method uh, that, that is placed at the beginning of the textbook. And uh, um, in your textbooks, that discussion and then the real world examples throughout the textbook um, have been crucial in, let's say, um, promoting statistical, what you call in your presentation, the statistical and the research skills, which is in another way, if you want to say another way, a way to contextualize the ability of statistics to answer many relevant questions, many questions of relevance. So can you discuss a little bit more this choice of um, discussing statistics in the context of the scientific method, which for me has been really a novel approach that has been able, uh, that, that's been allowing me to teach statistics in a much more engaging and interesting way. Thank you for the question. I, I agree with you. I think one of the, 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 the things you can see, um, and I don't mean to take this take away from other people the way that they teach, the, the, what their approaches that they make, and even the stances they take on the importance or relevance or, uh, or primacy of statistics. I mean, often the person who gets to teach the stats class is someone who enjoys doing statistics. They may not enjoy teaching it, but they do certainly do enjoy doing it. Uh, and what I have noticed is that there has been enormous expansion in um, data and individual computing power. And, a, and this has allowed a lot of people to expand exponentially the techniques they can use, different approaches. Now we now we talk we talk casually about you know random control trials, uh, trials and different diff equations and stuff. That was just that's you know that's kid stuff kind of not that stuff. And so talking about a class that goes from what is a variable to multiple regression or maybe logit, for example, is maybe I think for some people it feels a little bit remedial. It feels a little bit old or slow, for example, and often the class will get taught as, as in, okay, this is what we do, and then we do this, and then we do this, and so if you want to know the answer to this, you do this. Uh, and I feel like sometimes some of the textbooks feel that way a little bit as well. Um, there isn't quite the um, positioning of statistics in the larger research context. And so in the book, the first five chapters are the scientific method, Theory and theory and hypotheses, you know, data and variables, uh, and 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 research design and whatnot. Because I want to set the stage for introducing statistics as uh, in, in the way that you would in the way the same way that you would you would you would go into a tool shed and pick up a hammer. Uh, and so you can take this hammer and you can put it in your tool belt and you can go into the garden and you walk around the garden and you think to yourself, I need to to um, trim this olive uh, bush. So here's my hammer. I want to trim this olive bush. And you realize, wait a minute, this is not the best tool to do that, for example. And so you put it back in your tool belt. And you walk around the corner and you see that on the wooden fence, one of the, the panels has come loose. And you think to yourself, hey, this is a great opportunity for me to use. This is actually the really, this does a really good job of solving this problem, for example. And I think by teaching statistics a little bit critically, by showing when it doesn't work, when it does a not great job of explaining an outcome, and I don't mean that we're using the correct technique and we don't find something statistically significant. I mean, when the type of question we ask struggles to be answered by statistics itself, it isn't a failure. It is just not the right tool for this problem. And so we retreat to our researcher's mind. So rather than be, rather than create um, uh, a buzzing drone of, of, of coders who can write a lot of sta uh, state do files, I'd really rather have people who uh, really have students who walk away saying, I'm better at approaching a question and determining whether if I should use statistics, and if I should, this is what I should use, because that's what's appropriate to these variables, to this question, that kind of thing. And so instead of creating, I don't want to create statisticians, I want to create scientists. I want people to learn, use see, statistics. In fact, that's one of the big points that I make in the book. People confuse doing statistics for doing science, because they look the same. It's, oh, it's real fancy, and it's got this and that, whatever, and it doesn't have test tubes and white jackets. But when you see some of the, the regression output or the fancy techniques, people go, whoa, that's really impressive. Is it? Because if we look at it, it's all basically the fundamental stuff in a more complex setting. Is it, is it the right solution to this question? Is it the right approach to this question? Though it's a researcher question. That's what scientists ask. And I think that's the really important part of, 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 um, of avoiding, this, avoiding this problem at, at all. 
now you have to avoid the, the other problem, which is of course making them feel like they can do everything. They're not over, you know, you go, I can do multiple regression. I can, you know, solve every problem. You can't, you know, send them into a construction site with their hammer going. Well, there's a bit more involved in building the building than than kind of cleaning up the garden, for example. Uh, we have to avoid that as well. But one of the ways that I find that that's most effectively uh, imbued in the class is by the real questions that we ask in the class. And exactly what you said, I think the real examples from the data and in the, in the from the book, then you can use the data set. It, you can go and replicate everything in the book. And I've left, I've even put extra variables. You can say, let's explore further. Where does this go? You're the researcher. I think that's a, 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 a first of all, a great question and a very common problem with, that, that has, a, has a potential solution to it, a potential way to address that. Contextualizing this. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, you almost answered my second question, which oh. was actually basically the, uh, I also was wondering uh, if you have any uh, sort of suggestion on how to deal with the students that do have actually a quantitative background and uh, can do quite a lot. And so, you know, they show up and they have some statistical training and are often sitting in the back bored, bored. Uh, <laughs> more bored than you can possibly explain because of course they just have to take another class and you know yeah. this year uh, teaching a compulsory statistical class this was very clear there was a group of students that were like bored because they already did it and, and then the vast majority was scared and really uh, very worried because this was a statistical class it's compulsory and they're not gonna get it and I I uh, you know how do you deal with this uh, as a this difference in, among students and one of the that's basically already answered because one of the way I tried to deal with this was to use this approach, this scientific approach to statistics, essentially, by embedding it in the context of a research question. And I had students that came to me saying, I can finally understand how I can use right. this code, what yeah. this code is about. And then yeah. at the same time, I had the students that were terrified by statistics showing up and saying, it's not that bad. It's really interesting. And now I can go into a dinner conversation and uh, be able to actually uh, understand the differences between an opinion and a scientific fact, because I'm going to ask about standard errors. And if they cannot come up with standard <laughs> errors, I know this is an opinion. So everybody found it really, really rewarding. So let me ask you uh, my my uh, my uh, my last question, because I also have a very limited time, unfortunately, because um, it was very interesting to teach statistics with this textbook, and I would have many more questions. And this is about um, female students, because um, I often... Um, I've seen a tendency of women in my classes to basically be underconfident in statistics and to assume from the start that this is a very hard field for them. Yeah. And this lack of self-confidence can actually undermine their ability to fully engage in the learning process. Do you have any recommendations on how to teach statistics, let's say, inclusively, so that female students can overcome their worries? Well, it's a great question. And you, I imagine, would have a lot uh, of interest in that question. And, and, and in fact, a lot to say to that as someone who studied research, uh, 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 returns to education, and also gender disparities. How we have, well, how I've tried to deal with that is um, one of the things is, is, is subtle things. So in the book, for example, I refer to researchers as her or she, for example. I also try to look for a balance between the cited work, the research that's presented is I try to look for a balance between female and male um, uh, uh, authors, for example, academics, as, ac academics, for example. Uh, it, it goes down to classroom management. Well, you have this, this, this uh, uh, you know, calling, calling on, on students, making an effort to make sure everyone's involved or trying to, trying to balance out the involvement. Well. But I understand, I mean, my understanding is that is that coming out of high school in literally every country, you know, women are smarter than men on, a, on the whole. And their experience with mathematics instruction has been some has been a big part of the problem. I don't know if I have any trick that undoes that, that those experiences, but what we can do is create an atmosphere in which um, that isn't that isn't part of the instruction, for example. Um, um, one of the, again, one of the ways we do this is that in, in, in the way that we, we work on questions is including gender as something we investigate and and including women um, research point of views as a means to better understand a question for example to have problems so solved better by uh, uh, female perspectives or, 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 or abilities or whatnot and um, you'd be surprised in the book there's a number of examples in where men and women or gender is, is implicated in either the question or in the solution and not in a banal passing way it's, it's a casual it's a nice this box or that box for a math test, but it's engaged as a question. Again, pulling back to the researcher approach, saying, you know, this is this is how we how how the tables are even, even though we may not feel like they're even. 
in, in, in Italian universities, as you know, the ma master's students tend to be largely represented by women. And I, I taught a mandatory class this past year, and I thought the engagement levels were much higher than I remember before. Um, I think it's a matter, I think it's, it's not a matter of, uh, of, of un, undoing things that have been done before. I don't think that's a, any one person's ability to do that. Uh, but I think there is material for them to see where their engagement is rewarded uh, and that there isn't any challenge to their engagement. And, 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 and there seems to be some small success with that. Thank you. Uh, that was very helpful, Brenda. Yes, I, I have been having very good reports also from female students at the end of the class, even though they all started with big worries about uh, the fear <laughs> of the numbers and the fear of the formulas. Right, right, right. And, of uh, and I, I agree with you uh, that, um, you know, most of them are very high, very high grades. So, you know, this was completely like a self-perception of uh, of inferiority basically in math skills and so but um, I think the example through the textbook yes uh, they were very helpful uh, so you know the idea that gender was included uh, in several examples and also in examples that they could then replicate with real data and looking at for example gender disparity in boys uh, or uh, um, you know the, the distribution of role inside the households by gender it was very interesting for students uh, using statistics to debate topics related to gender disparities that most of the students found it really, really interesting. As you said, one of the reasons is because at least in Italy, um, the, vast, uh, the vast majority of students in uh, master level are females. So they were very interested in understanding gender disparity using statistics and, and the scientific methods. So starting from a research <laughs> question down to answering it. And then from the results, getting these policy recommendations. So, you know, one thing that I want to stress as well is this, for me at least, you know, this example were very interesting because they were answering real world question, but not just real question, but question of policy relevance. Question for which, question which answers would inform decision-making. So it was very rewarding, very empowering for the students to then be able to potentially talk to a policymaker, have results to present in front of an audience. So. Thank you. It has been a pleasure and really well, I, I, very I, good. I, I, again, I want to say thank, thankful to, sorry, sorry. I want to say thank you again. I think a lot of what, uh, a lot, I think most very, the vast majority of instructors would benefit from just being reminded, you know, women's experiences with math instruction coming up through secondary, middle, elementary, middle, and, and, and uh, secondary school is something that, that, that may be a challenge to some, just being made aware. Uh, so that when you're teaching, when you're engaging with students and stuff, to, just to, to know that that's a case and say, okay, I'll make an extra effort. I think that can go a long way in, in, in leveling and in, in, in being a part of the being part of the solution rather than part of the problem. So, thank you. Thank you again. I think thank that. Uh, thank you very much. I know that was that was really really fantastic discussion. Thank you very much for raising those very very important questions, um, Cara and Matthew, for your kind of um, responses to those. I think you know there's still um, so much further to go I think but I think in this we are addressing so many different things that are challenges and that can you know sort of like quick takeaways that I think people can you know instantly apply to their own situation in their classroom in their um in their lecture halls I really loved that um <laughs> the analogy that you made earlier as well uh, Matthew not every student wants to be there I think this is like <laughs> it's something that we wish would be the case that every person wants to be in that into that in that setting but um yes how do you reach those ones that don't want to be there oh and that's a thing isn't it and um carol those are very very valid questions and I'm, i hope that those um go some way to answering sort of how to address them with the um you know content that you've described already um now my co colleagues daniel and georgina have been looking at the questions and answers and we still we have some time now to take questions from the audience members if you want to write those in the question and answer box um matthew and chiara are both here to answer them for you uh we've got a few minutes left of this webinar like um so we, we've got time to take your questions now um if there are any um but actually, I was just going to mention that before um, we, we'd asked uh, people to submit some in advance as well, and um, Daniel and Georgina forwarded a couple to me, um, which, we, which we took from an offline source earlier on. So if you don't mind, I'll just um, kind of ask you some of these, if that's all right, too. Um, and I think one's just come in now, too, from uh, Heath Brown. So maybe if we don't mind taking this one first. Um, so he said, uh, apologies if this has been answered. I don't teach in a political science department, but how will this text work with students in public administration or public policy? Um, Thank you, uh, Professor Brown, for your for your question. <clears throat> I, I, 
to be quite honest with you, I think it would be uh, easily adaptable to a, a strict political science curriculum, for example. Opening up the themes for questions, opening up the real data, for example, is it will really expanded the places that the, the, the questions can expand, extend to. Um, for public policy, for example, th there are a number of policy questions that are, that are involved in, in the book uh, as well. And that, and that includes not only the ones that are worked examples as well, but also the, 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 the questions at the end of the book. Also, the instructor's manual includes um, an additional, uh, I think, more than 25 questions per, per, per uh, chapter, additional questions that even reach farther uh, in, on the number of themes um, that are covered. Um, I think it would be a book that might, you might want to take a look at. It might be something that you could use. Again, the focus of the book is on the pedagogy of getting students uh, over, the, you know, over the goal line. And that's really the, the, the focus of the book. If we can you know, get them to wrap their heads around it. Not every example, not every example in the book can be an example for your class, just as, just as they are, even for my class. Um, but they're, 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 it's a wealth of things to pull from. Thank you, Dr. Brown. <clears throat> I'll, I'll take just a second just to, to mention something, for example, in, in, in terms of uh, developing the book, one of the ideas, one of the main um, contributions of the book is to take descriptive and inferential statistics and separate them completely so that they're the first part of the book uh, is the research, is the scientific method, but the second part is, is a focus on description uh, and, and what that entails. What I found was that even by separating, if, when, we, when, by, when we're teaching statistics, we often are telling them, well, what's the, the, the substantive finding and what's the statistical finding we're asking at the same time, we start immediately with that. If you hold off on the statistical significance testing, you actually can and you de, 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 start determining what is substantive and what is statistical, the difference becomes very quickly different uh, uh, for them and they, they can really tell the difference and they don't get them confused. They don't make that, that confounding thing, well, it's statistically significant, so it must be important, it must be substantively important. We really, did, we start out by really determining what it is and what it means to be substantively related, and then we turn to the process of testing those relationships we previously observed and the new data, for example. And how, what is the process of statistical? And we spend a, quite a long time on the intuition of statistical significance, the use of the central limit theorem, and these kinds of things. And you can pick from that what you want to use. You don't have to go through every chapter and use every bit, a bit and bob there. You can, you can choose from this part of the chapter that explains. This part of the central limit theorem and may extend farther than you want to go, for example, um, but that's there for you to use. Uh, and I, I have been, had great success. As soon as I spent those in half, I, the, the level of success went up. You could feel it. Uh, students, it didn't, it wasn't so scary. It wasn't so intimidating. Uh, I think that's one of the big, uh, I wanted to make sure to get that in there and, and say that, um, that I think that's a big innovation of the book. And again, if you've got a short semester or if you've got a year-long semester, it really depends on how you stretch it out. There's 20 chapters, um, and that make that makes it, that can make up a, a full year if you wanted to expanding on different themes and different parts of the books. And there's lots of sections in the book that say we're you know you, you know if you want to know more, you can follow the, the, this trail. This trail leads off this way into the woods, for example. At each stage in both in, in, in the stage of the the research methods in the stage of descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. And then it all converges on what I call the high plateau of multiple regression. That's where we bring it all together and we see description and control and inference merge into the, the illustrial, uh, illustrious tri triumvirate, which I call it. Um, and that, is, uh, th that leads us into the more technical uh, uh, test, you know, looking at, at, the, um, at the, the rules of OLS, for example, moving into logic regression uh, and, and beyond. And then there's a chapter on ethics at the end uh, that has I've received a lot of compliments on. Uh, I've rearranged the way that it was written a bit, and also extensions to this: a discussion of big data, a discussion of Bayesian Bayesian challenge, and, and what that means, and how these how these approaches are related. For example, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm just going to see if there's any more questions. There's another question here from um, James Galleon. Uh, and James is asking, currently making my way through your book, and so far I'm a big fan. <laughs> That's great to hear. Um, um, I teach basic project management and statistics to adults at my company and appreciate the everyman approach. Um, and you're right, you're not all students want to be there. Occasionally, some of the instructors don't want to be there either. Hope you don't mind if I shamelessly plagiarize some of your material. <laughs> 
Well, and I'm, I'm very fortunate to know Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Commander James Gallion, and uh, I do know that we, he actually contacted me and we've spoken about this book, uh, and he, he's, he teaches outside of academia and has said, said that this is quite useful. The parts that he can use are, are, are absolutely applicable to his very different field uh, that we're in. He said, it's, he said the, the, I think the phrase, the Everman approach, which is novel to me, which I think is a nice way of describing it. It's just kind of like, you know, hey, you know, this is not something scary. I'm not trying to intimidate you with this. I want you to be able to, 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 to solve these problems. You know, this is, this, I, it's great if more people can do it. So thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you. And I'm just going to see if there's any more questions that have come in. We have got um, a few questions that I mentioned, which had come in earlier. So I'm just going to ask um, a couple of these, if you don't mind, um, Matthew and Piara, to answer these. So this one is about, um, actually, so you addressed a little bit about this during your presentation and during the discussion. It was about real world data. So um, very often student wants to, students want to use real world data that they don't know where to start. Um, they tend to begin with statistical model without considering how it works in the wider context of what they're trying to achieve. And what advice would you give um, those who in that context? Uh, I'm happy. To, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, uh, the, using the real world data does have that uh, does have that sometimes have that challenge because students come back and say, you know, now I now I've answered my question. You go, well, actually, you know, we're going to have to expand on that by engaging the literature. Uh, and they go, well, what's engaging the literature? And you say, well, that will be taught in your research design class if you haven't done it in your own class. Um, and uh, introducing them to the role, the, 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 the skills that they've been learning and, and putting in their investigative uh, skill set are, are, are part of the overall scientific approach to how we do things or, or investigate, even analytical, just this investigative approach. Um, but I think one of the challenges, of course, is downloading real data and cleaning it up and using it, that kind of, the, those kinds of challenges are there. Some students balk at that and other students jump right in. Uh, I, I think that's a bit of a bit of uh, you, you don't really know until you talk to the students, for example. Um, but it is, I think, one of the empowering part of this is what Pierre had mentioned earlier, which is that you know, this is the data. I mean, this it, this is you can say something with this. You know, this is the data that I use. This is the data that other people use to pr pr promote an idea or defend a position or advocate for a policy, for example. And I think a lot of people really respond to that. If I can just add one 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 comment on this, uh, the students like this approach so much that some uh, came to me and said, "How do I collect my own data? Now, how do I collect the data?" So <laughs> I was like, "You know what? You're got so interested in statistics, you're gonna have to take another class on survey data methodology." <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's working very well. Right. Well, I, and I see that uh, uh, Professor Prentice has, 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 has added in a comment. I'm very happy to see that you've enjoyed, uh, that this is, has worked for you. That's a, 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 a really is a, a, a touching comment. And congratulations on your PhD. Uh, I, know that that's, uh, I know that's a challenge. And so, I, uh, Professor Prentice, so thank you for your comment very much. Um, Fantastic. There is another question as I, well uh, from I, Scott Moser. Hi, Scott. Um, uh, um, can I read it out? Because I'm uh, I'm not sure if it will be visible to everybody. See, mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll, so, or would you read it out? Happy please? quickly. To, I'll just I'll just quickly respond to Scott. I, thank you. Thank you for your question, and it's great to, great to hear from you. Uh, you know that is that's the challenge. Is is you've got uh, you usually get supermoted group, which is not the, the majority, and then you get uh, the warm lukewarm middle, and then you get the the, the foot draggers. That's the that's the set. I find that I can uh, I can usually no. When people come to the class with a quantitative, ex, you know, I've had a quantitative class before, what I've never found anyone who's finished. There's always something to learn. And I find that this presentation is a more intuitive way of doing it. They always go, oh, you know, that helps me understand it, these kinds of things. Uh, for this, for the, the, the group that's a little bit more resistant, the intuitive approach has been really successful uh, and bringing up. So basically, you're kind of bringing this group together by kind of truncating the, the 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 ends of it a little bit you don't want to slow down your resources but you want to that you want to let them graze a little bit and the other group you want to bring out by saying hey look at what they're doing you're doing it you know you're 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 getting the same the same uh exposure to these skill sets and it's there for you and it's intuitive it's open for you to to, to understand for example um it's a challenge that's the really the challenge isn't it yeah <laughs> Thank you. And I think we have time for just one last question here. And I'm just going to sort of, um, so this one is a really interesting one. Um, it's what opportunities does artificial intelligence offer for students in politics? 
Well, that's a good question. I think I'm going to defer to Professor Brunelli, uh, to Chiara, because she's actually our AI expert. Uh, she's involved in an AI project at, at, Indi uh, at, at, at um, Bologna here, which I believe is part of a, the largest network of, of, of academics studying AI in Europe, if not the world. Uh, and <clears throat> I'm not, I think, I mean, I, and I would just say if the potentials are prob probably limitless. Uh, we probably don't know <laughs> uh, at this point. Um, thank you. It's a great question, and it's a very uh, difficult question to answer. But I think that uh, the first aspect uh, of um, the social impacts of, of AI uh, is what I want just to, to mention, which is that we don't know uh, much about what are the social consequences of artificial intelligence. And so I would actually turn around a little bit the question and say, what's the role for political scientists and political science students in um, understanding AI and building a better AI for everybody? And there I, I think that uh, teaching statistics using the, the um, scientific method, so underscoring the very important aspect of theory, uh, is crucial for us uh, as a community, and therefore where I can very much there is a need for social scientists to participate, to build an AI that works for us. So that, yes, we can build an artificial intelligence that can be really, really beneficial to us first. So I would say that for political scientists uh, um, and therefore political science students, it's crucial to um, learn uh, the importance of theory, the importance of the scientific method, uh, the importance of using quantitative methods in the context of a theory framework so that we can build an artificial intelligence to work for everybody and is fair and equal and open and transparent. And then that this AI would be the one that we need um, and will do great things for social scientists and for the community overall, for our community overall. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was that that that's yes, it's one of those things that we have to be there on the cutting edge and know sort of where we have to go with this. But things are changing as we so fast, so quickly. So it's good to have this to know these studies are happening and um there is a way to deal with these in a positive way. Um now that's actually that's all we actually have time for now. So um if anybody has asked a question that we didn't get around to answering yet, don't worry, we'll try to follow up with you after the session. So um, everybody who um, is attending, don't forget to um, visit our webpage to find out more about Matthew's new textbook, Political Analysis. Um, and if you want to buy a copy of that um, book, Political Analysis, you can get a discount code of 25% using um, the code UKPOLY25. Uh, and lecturers or course leaders can also request an electronic inspection copy from our webpage. So we will be sending you an email after the session with the webinar recording link to, so you can watch it again if you want to, or share it with your colleagues who may be interested and may not have been able to join. But once again, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Matthew for his fascinating presentation and to Chiara for the insightful interview and discussion, and to my Sage colleagues, Georgina and Dan, for their help in the technical side and the questions and answers. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, thank you again, and goodbye.